Hello and welcome to episode 12 of Establish the Collection. I am Cody May, always by my favorite co-host, the Giants hat-wearing man, Gary Hartman. Gary, how's it going, buddy? Unless I know something different, I think I'm your only co-host, so I will uh, <laughs> just take it as a compliment anyway, but I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm great. It's like saying uh, you're my favorite child, but now I've got three of those, so I can't do right. that anymore. No, you can't. Uh, no, 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 no. You're my, you're my favorite co-host, even though you're my only co-host. I won't ask you which child of yours is your favorite because we know everyone has favorites. <laughs> that is true. There, there, there are favorites in their own special way. Yes, there you go. Cody's kids don't listen to this in ten years or whenever you would start oh, listening man, to podcast. Brutal. <laughs> Sorry, kids. Love you. Well, how, how are things going, Gary? It's we're good. we're yeah. game game one of the finals just finished up. We're we're consistently recording after basketball games. It feels like we yep. got the surprise that Giannis was going to play. Giannis played pretty well, I thought. But the Bucks looked outmatched. You got any any initial takeaways after Game One in Phoenix? Not too much. I was encouraged that it was an overall entertaining game for the most part. You know, it didn't seem like Phoenix ever really lost the grasp of the game, as you said. Giannis in the first quarter, especially, kind of kept it close. Towards the end of the first quarter, Phoenix put their foot on the pedal and never really let up. However, it was close enough to her to be a game for most of it. So I was happy to see that. Happy to see a mostly healthy Giannis, it looks like, which is really important for the overall outlook of this series. So I'm encouraged, hoping we get a great series. Would love to see this go six or seven. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later on in the episode, but there's a lot of hobby impact and overall just legacy impact involved here. So it's exciting stuff. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and before we get into today's episode, we teased it last week. You guys came out in full force. I think we're up to what we decide 47 reviews now yep. uh, on, on, on Apple iTunes. We appreciate you guys for coming out in full force, checking out the show, subscribing, rating, reviewing. If Again, if you haven't done that and you want to be eligible for future giveaways, and things like this, please stop the episode now and go do that. Subscribe. We really appreciate it. Um, but for this week, I will be sending out this 1999 Upper Deck Retro Basketball Pack to M. C. and Frony. And Mike, you've interacted with Gary on Twitter. I'm, I apologize if I'm butchering your name. I probably am. But Mike, DM me or Gary at CMain7 at GHartman314. Nailed it. And I will mail out this pack to you, Mike. We appreciate you listening. Uh, I know that Gary mentioned as we selected your name that you've interacted with him in the DMs. So, again, really appreciate appreciate you for checking out the show. Yeah, congrats, Mike. I know you were listening to us really early on. You're a, a super nice guy. Very happy that you uh, were able to win this. And as Cody said, please subscribe, rate, review. If you haven't already, if as once you get a review in there and your name, your username on iTunes or whatever is in there, you will be eligible for all of these moving forward. Just because you did it at the very beginning or you haven't done it yet, you know, it doesn't make a difference when you left us a review. You will be eligible for any giveaways we do moving forward. And with me giving away a pack, I think you're next up on the giveaway list, right? Yep. Something coming from your personal collection at some point in the near future. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out we'll off air. We'll come up with something cool. And it won't be this, uh, let's see what I have right in front of me. It will not be this Luka Simonich blockchain redemption card, guys. It will not be. I promise. <laughs> It'll be something much better than that, okay? I uh, I assure you of it. So You're too kind. You're too kind. All right. I've got a self-imposed time limit on today's podcast because I think we've pushed, what, an hour and 10 and an hour and 15 minutes in back-to-back -back episodes, and you guys are probably getting sick of hearing our voices. So we're going to burn through some hobby news and notes, and then actually at the end of this episode, we're going to take our first listener questions on air. So uh, really excited about this episode. Hopefully, we can answer some questions. And, and actually, I think the questions are really good, really uh, good macro discussion. Hopefully, we can help a few people out with some questions that they hit us with in Discord, but really good macro discussion on today's episode. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it with some of the biggest hobby notes uh, from the last week or so since we last recorded. At the end of last episode, Gary, I gave you about 90 seconds to hit on some news and notes before I kicked you off air. Uh, you mentioned PSA reopening, but I didn't, give you the, I didn't give you the full time limit you needed to go over all that. So for anyone that doesn't know, PSA, obviously one of the biggest graders, probably the biggest grader in the sports card hobby. They shut down submissions on March 30th to work through a massive backlog that they have been dealing with, some 10 million cards that still need to be graded. Um, so they announced on July 1st, as they said they would, that they were going to reopen a couple of tiers. And Gary mentioned that on last week's episode. Can you, can you pick up from there and explain what's going on at PSA? 
Yeah, first of all, I, I I respect what they did overall. You know that they that they shut down. We've spoken about this at length. They they had a problem where these wait times were no longer wait times. You were you were waiting months or up to a year, and it was getting ridiculous. So you had to do something. I had no problem with that. I give them credit for sticking to their word. And on July first, they did start, and they they said that they warned us that they might do a slowly reopen tier. So they did reopen their express tier on july 1st which is still very expensive you're not going to go in there and do bulk orders for 400 dollars plus card hoping to get you know all of your refractor good stuff um ordered unless you're feeling really really um frisky but you will uh, you know those are ranging from 150 to 200 dollars per card still so that's what's open as, along with the tiers that have been open this whole time which is the super express for 300 dollars and the walkthrough for 600 plus plus all those other uh, you know, higher ones for specialty, you know, 10K plus type cars that we've mentioned in the past. So it's good to see that these are reopening. I think that they're doing, they're um, catching up on the backlog, right, Cody? We were talking a little bit off air about where they're they're out to right now. So I don't know if you want to touch on a, a little bit of, of where they are, but they still have a, a ways to go. Yeah, and I was just checking out PSA's website uh, more recently in the last couple of weeks to see where they're at through their backlog and the value and the economy and the regular tiers are still uh, very much closed and they're still yep. very much in a massive backlog. Um, gem rate G E M R A T E is an account on Instagram. They were posting some of the data from just the last 30 days and some of the increases in, uh, cards that were graded over the last 30 days. And it was pretty wild to see some 736,000 cards were graded in June from PSA and the backlog still dates back to like August, September, October of 2020. So we're going to see a ton of cards still come out and hit the market, hit the secondary market from PSA. A lot of that of the ultra modern variety. So I don't know if what I wanted to get your thoughts on today from all of this, um, obviously express opening and some of these higher end tiers opening is good for people that have high end cards that they've been wanting to get graded. Right. Yep. Yep. It helps. But more, more importantly, looking at some of the lower end stuff, some of the base stuff, um, do you, do you think that there's still some potential for the market to um, take a downturn even further than what we've already seen, given some of the supply that may hit the market over the next couple of months as they do finally work through this backlog? Yeah. So the reason that we've said that the base stuff is is sc possibly even scarier than we've seen so far and that we don't know if when the bottom's fully fallen out on that stuff is because – Cody and I were also just talking about this off air, but the way PSA is going through their backlog is they're going to basically take everything the, the the more expensive the submission was, that's what they're going to hit first. So the, the cheapest type of submission back when things were still open March and earlier of 2021 was the value ultra modern 2018 plus is the stuff that they probably haven't gotten to yet, or they're starting to get to now. For example, my one order that is still a PSA is about 300 cards and it's a value ultra modern 2018 plus. So that's like 10 bucks a card or less. Uh, and the reason that those are going to be the, and that was entered mid October, by the way. So that's obviously going to be the reason why those are going to be the last to be addressed because they're the, the cheapest submission. So now there's gonna be a lot of people like me that have those submissions that have been in there now for, by the time we get them back, it could be 10 months, you know, something like that. And yeah, in my submission of 300 cards, there's certainly a handful of base cards, a good amount of base cards. And it's not all that I, I tried to, I tried, I've always tried to keep my stuff more refractors or short prints, but you know, of course, you know, if it was a big rookie or whatever, you want to make sure that stuff was graded. So I'm sure that those types of submissions, the ultra value modern 2018 plus are going to be coming back out over the next one to three, four months. And you know, that could impact those pop reports even more, you know, that Luka Doncic 2018 pop of his base card. That's at what 17,000 or whatever it was is has a real potential to hit an even higher number now actually maybe he's not the best example only because you know his this still does go on the value of the card so it's going to hard to it's because that card was like a thousand dollar plus card at the time it's going to hard to fit that card in this type of submission but someone like deandre ayton for example right who we're seeing completely take off in the finals right now i guarantee a lot of his base cards are in submissions like this because those were sub hundred dollar type cards so you're going to see a lot of those cards flood the market still. So yeah, some of these base cards that have taken hits that have gone to the, you know, double digit ranges that may have been triple digits three or four months ago could get possibly even lower. I'm not too afraid of anything above that though. I still think we'll, we'll be okay as, as some of these pops trickle back in. So you think the natural way to handle this from a buying perspective at this point is to, and you've, you've preached this throughout the first, you know, dozen episodes of the show, you're still looking at shorter printed refractors and things like that, that, 
uh, maybe even serial numbered stuff that you know the pop count isn't going to get too high on? Yeah, I, I like to stick to serial number cards if I can specifically within those short prints and refractors because you, you know that the high say something's out of you know you got a blue ice out of 99 or something you know the highest that's that pop could ever get is 99 and it's not going to right so right you know i prefer to to do that now, obviously that's a much more expensive route to take uh but i still would yeah i prefer to go the silver prism route than the base prism route just because you're still that pop will be tame compared to something that we just don't know what the ceiling is um, usually hitting the ceiling is a good thing in our community in DFS. I don't, I don't know if it's a good thing when it comes to base cards and pop reports. So, yeah, to, I mean, to your point, just looking at some of the data from the last month, um, that was posted by gem rate, there were 20,000 Kobe cards graded yeah. in the last month, 22,000 LeBron cards, over 50,000 Michael Jordan cards. So yeah, like you said, as they continue to work through these lower value pop, uh, lower value cards, you're going to start to see those pop counts rise and supply to flood the market a little bit. You might see some of this base stuff get even lower than it already has over the last couple of months. Yeah, and they shut down like a month after this stuff hit all time highs in February, right? So like people were just grading everything they could possibly grade, yeah. maximize their collection. You can't blame them, but mm -hmm. it's it's going to have an impact now on the back end here. You know, we'll see what it does. But uh, I, I do think even if it does impact stuff like silver prisms, which it will, it will not have the extreme impact, the large scale impact that it's going to for base just because those short those print runs are naturally shorter. So, yeah, you know, th that stuff could go down still, too, as some of the stuff trickles out, specifically silvers or, or things that we don't know the print run on exactly uh, in the refractor range. But it, it won't be to the level that base cards are. Yeah. In keeping with the PSA theme, PSA's parent company, Collectors Holdings, acquired Golden Auction in a, in a huge deal that was announced just recently. I believe it was last week, mm -hmm. uh, led by Nat Turner and Mets owner Steve Cohen. The company dedicated to investing in growing the collectibles industry and focusing on developing tools and services to better enable seamless participation from hobbyists, those new enthusiasts, and alt investors, acquired the huge auction company. Uh, what is the recent auction? What does the recent acquisition for um, collectors holding of golden auctions mean for the hobby? Yeah, I mean Nat Turner just seems to be like taking over the entire industry at this point. You know, coming in and, and get taking PSA and now taking probably the the biggest name in the. Not, I'm not going to just saying auction house uh, streets. It's probably the second biggest name in all of the the card sale streets after eBay these days. Oh, is yeah. Golden auctions, you know. Yeah. Uh, in the news all the time, you know, Ken Golden's face is seemingly everywhere. He has a pilot show coming out. Uh, I think he's still <laughs> going to be heavily involved. You know, they um, his face is on CNBC all the time. Like he, you know, they they're a they're a big deal. And you know, we saw that round of investing from a couple months ago with guys like Mark Cuban and Bill Simmons and. Um, you know, a, a lot of big names. And now Nat Turner, Steve Cohen, two huge names kind of coming in and buying the company. I think it's a good thing overall for it. It's going to keep golden auctions at the, the as the cream of the crop for the auction side of things, I think, you know, coming with that big money, that big infrastructure on the back end. So for guys like me that have some super, super high end rare stuff that I'd want to sell, I, there's no reason for me to necessarily look to another auction house. Now, I, I don't, I don't know what it means for some of the other auction houses out there that have some reputable names. I'm sure they might be uh, a little scared about this. To me, the biggest the biggest possible impact is, you know, kind of the laying in bed with PSA, the PSA Golden yeah. Auctions crossover. You know, are they not going to take something that's a beach? You know, are, are they not going to I shouldn't say they'll obviously take something. It's they, they can. It's not uh, you know, you're not working with integrity not to. But, um, you know, say I send them a BGS 10, 10 pristine card as opposed to the same card in a PSA 10, are they, are they not going to push that BGS 10 card as much on their, you know, they, you know how they, they um, advertise and they push yeah, these cards on their right. socials. Are they not going to do that as much? That's the kind of thing that would worry me. I know Nat Turner came out, I don't have the statement in front of me, came out with a statement about how important the integrity is of golden auctions. And he's he would never let the two things in or um, impact each other negatively. But, you know, it's certainly something that, you know, it's kind of like clutch and LeBron, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, you know. Yeah, there's no fair treatment there. No, right. not at all. So, but right. but yeah, you you hope that they can that they're able to separate those two businesses and keep that thing separate. Like you said, there, it just wouldn't make sense from a business standpoint for for Golden if they've got a, a premier auction that may be graded BGS nine point five or BGS ten, not to push that the same way they would a PSA ten, right? Right, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But overall, I don't think it's a bad thing, man. I, it, to have that, they those guys know what they're doing. They're good business people. Um, 
say what you will about Steve Cohen in the in the finance world. Uh, yeah, you know, I know I have a ton of, as I mentioned, I have a ton of Mets fans, friends in my life that adore the guy now, and uh, I, I think he's 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 a he's an, an interesting guy to be involved in the hobby, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to have his money come in. Yeah, and, and it keeps the keeps the hobby in the news. That obviously it made the cycles when when the deal was announced. So right. always always good to have more eyeballs on the hobby. Absolutely. All right. Well, Golden is usually the one setting records, but we we got earlier today, and I, I messaged you after this that the hobby never lets us rest. It always is providing content. A five point nine million dollar Stephen Curry National Treasure one of one rookie logo man auto just sold today to Alt. Uh, they're an investment fund man. Uh, it's an investment fund managed by Alt. They purchased a 51% stake in the card, and it values it at the highest uh, highest modern day card ever. Yeah, beating LeBron. So, what do you what do you make of a one of one Steph Curry selling for 5.9 million? I love this. It feels right to me, honestly. Like if you, if you just take into account what the card industry has done over the last three to five years, and who has been the the face of young people and in, in, in the, as as NBA fans and just the face of, you know, just kind of universal love and pray and praise from a uh, from the NBA and and really from American sports over the last ten years while this Warriors dynasty has been going on, Steph Curry is just the perfect guy to hold this record for now, and I. You know, his stuff, and you, you asked me off air if I have a lot of Steph Curry. I really don't have too much Steph just because his stuff has always been kind of a little bit out of my price range, uh, yeah. even from the very beginning of, of when I was in getting into this stuff when the market wasn't nearly as hot as it has been over the last year. So, you know, I, I'm not surprised about this. You know, his RPAs and his low print rookie stuff has always been super, super high end, and I, I don't expect that to change anytime soon. It's still good to see this stuff at the high end continue to break records. I know we kind of harp on this on every show, but as as the base cards in the hobby seem to be continuously dropping, and it's been kind of this 90-day free, free fall, um, 17 of the most expensive 25 cards uh, in sales have occurred this year alone. So over the last seven months, we've seen 17 of the most expensive 25 cards sold. So again, really good sign for the hobby as a whole. We're seeing these Grail-type assets continue to break records. Uh, Steph Curry's, you know, selling for more than LeBron, more than Wayne Gretzky, more than, uh, you know, the the Honus Wagner. So yep. again, really good sign, I think, for the overall health of the hobby, and good for someone like myself who's in the fractional streets. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I'm never going to get my hands. I, maybe knock on wood, someday I will, but I, I don't think I'm ever going to get my hands on a 5.9 million dollar card all on my own. So uh, a, w- a good way to get invested, good way to get exposure to these high end assets is to to dip your toes into the fractional streets. Yep, and that's why one of the first purchases I made on Rally was a Steph Curry NTRPA because uh, I knew I was never, you know, in all likelihood, I've never had my hand on that card. And I yeah. love, I love him, and I love National Treasures rookie patch autographs, and that always made sense to me as an investment. Uh, I have a good segue for us into the next topic because, yeah, it's great to see that the super, super high end is still setting records. But something else that I've been really encouraged about over the last two weeks is we're actually seeing the market. Um, on the high end of elite cards kind of go back that way. Uh, and one of the main indicators of that is the LeBron James Topps Chrome PSA 10 rookie card. If you look at that over the last two weeks, we're up 61% on that thing. It hit lows of like 12 grand about a month ago, which yeah. were lows, you know, lows for what it has been over the last year and a half. And now, uh, you know, two days ago, one sold for 21,000 again. So we're up 10, 10 grand almost on that card, which is great to see. And I think part of the reason this is, and this is just the theory, is that the national is around the corner. And, you know, I think that, you know, people start to hype up prices. People start to buy in bulk when they're going to go to this big national convention. If you don't know what the national is, it's in three weeks. Uh, It happens every year, except last year it did not happen due to COVID. It was supposed to happen last year in Atlantic City, which would have been great for me uh, being, you know, in in my my home state. But it's going to be in Chicago this year. And this is the National Card Collector Convention, or National uh, sports collectibles convention nscc uh and it is the biggest the 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 most important event in the hobby every single year and it definitely has an impact on the overall market there's so much movement that is happening at this event and leading up to this event both on the uh, minuscule scale you know dollar boxes of cards and you know one dollar per card in, in big boxes at, at many tables and on the highest scales you're going to see private uh, sales at these types of events for them in the millions of dollars range. You know, you have every big player at these things. Unfortunately, uh, I'm not able to make it this year. I had a trip already planned for that weekend. Uh, if any of you are going to be there, I wish you uh, the best of luck. Have a great time. Um, 
you know, be safe, have fun, but uh, I will definitely be getting there next year, wherever, it, wherever it is, but it's a, it's a big deal. And I would expect to see card prices over the next month be impacted positively because of this. And I think things like the reason I say this LeBron card could be tied to something like that is I think investors are starting to buy up some of those, you know, flagship overall cards that are in indexes and things like that to bring to the convention. They want to see the market be healthy as everyone's leading up to a place where they're going to be buying and selling. And uh, I, I know that's not any kind of data that's telling you that that's part of the reason, but uh, you will see the national um, have, have in likelihood a, a positive impact on the overall card market. I think this is where you need to flex your muscle next year with Adam and Taylor and get them on the phone and tell them, Hey, we need all expenses paid trip to the national. Yep. Absolutely. We need to have a presence there. Gary needs to be able to flex his cards in person. Table space. We're going to do it all. We'll, uh, we'll yeah. do a, if, it, it, assuming this show is going to grow into the biggest card show in the world. Cause I trust all of you great listeners out there. We'll, uh, we'll do a live show from the national. We'll, we'll have a great time next year. Uh, Adam Taylor, <clears throat> you know, here, you're here us and uh, it's going to, it's going to be great. We don't ask for much, just just all expensive paid trip. Maybe That's a it. few cards in our pockets to to flash here and there, but That's, uh. that is all. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm excited to see and, and keep my eye on the news of any of anything exciting happening at the national. PSA and BGS will be at the national, so this got some, a little bit of pushback because they're going to be at the national and they're going to be accepting orders at the national, so they'll be taking in some <laughs> cards to grade there on site. Uh, so people are like, you know, it, I definitely got a little pushback, but they need to have a presence there. I'm not going to blame them, uh, and. You know, tops and Panini, they have big displays. They, they, Panini puts out um, special packs that you can only receive at the Nationals. So there's these gold VIP packs, silver VIP packs, where you get um, basically the first ever Zion rookie card from two years ago was out of that pack. So if before any of his other stuff came out, it was in a Duke uniform from Panini. And, uh, you know, if that stuff was great at PSA 10 before any of those other college or NBA products came out, they were a huge, huge deal. I actually have one in a PSA 10, which is probably worth a couple hundred bucks now. But at the time, it was worth, and this was like really early on in my hobby days, so I didn't necessarily know what to, to do with it that I should have sold at the time. But at the time, you know, those types of things, you know, the, might, the same thing might happen here in three weeks where you're going to get the first Cade Cunningham card on the market out of these packs. So, you know, you'll oh, see wow. that, that stuff on eBay and it's it's big stuff, a lot of it. They also have some black box one of one stuff. It's, you know, there's a lot of I- exclusive cards that come out of this convention as well. Very cool. So if you're going to be around Chicago, right, do they need to do, do the people need to purchase tickets ahead of time? Yeah. You need to get tickets and it does sell out. So, you know, I, I'm sure there's a secondary market for it. There's table space has been sold out for months and months and months because um, I had looked into it before. I necessarily knew my travel plans and it was already sold out when I was looking into it like four months ago. So um, table space, good luck. But as just going as a consumer or going as a, an attender of the event, uh, I have not looked. You have to check out the Nationals website to see what the situation with tickets is. I don't know if single day tickets are available, but there might be like full four day passes still available. Yeah, and I was looking at some other shows that just took place recently, and there was a record audience at the Philly show in June. So I would imagine that the Nationals just going to be a madhouse, right? I mean, it's just going to be so many people there. People are excited to get back out, even though the hobby can take place online, and you know we don't necessarily need to meet face to face for a lot of these transactions to happen. It's going to be really good for for some of these people that have been cooped up for the last 12, 15 months to uh, to get out and meet with meet with some of the people in the hobby. Yep, there's a ton of good signs about the hobby still being in a strong place. We we're, you know we just mentioned it with the record setting auctions we just mentioned it with something like where it's good to see some of these tops chrome psa lebron 03 stuff go up but also these card shows have been so so hot dallas does these quarterly shows you know four or five a year that have been just crazy you know the hype for them is insane the the attendance they're selling out like it's it's been great and this is kind of at the back end of a pandemic or you know even in texas it was it was during the pandemic no yeah. judgment passing here but um <laughs> you know it's 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 a big deal, and uh, you know you, you, the, the national now with it being canceled last year, with the market the 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 hobby being hotter than it ever has been, I would expect this to be the the most exciting impact one yet, for sure. For sure. Well, from the physical to the digital world, Top Shot has been has been actually really quiet lately. Uh, yeah. I, I noticed we got a looking at my Twitter mentions. We got a pack drop coming this week, I believe. Another playoff pack drop coming this week. But the news that was made this week was was a little bit more interesting than that. Daryl Moore bought a Ben Simmons S2 hollow icon for $4,444 and uh, Twitter went kind of insane, right? I, it was, I don't know if you saw a whole lot of it. Um, it was pretty funny to see after the fact and all the reactions. All I want to imagine is Daryl Morey sitting on a beautiful leather couch, sipping some wine and just laughing at Neil O'Shea and, you know, and all these guys that, that he's sending these mixed signals about Ben Simmons as he's trying to get, trying to uh, get him off the books. 
That's exactly what I picture also. Now, I didn't really follow it much in real time, but um, I, I caught up on it a little bit. Uh, Maury's a funny guy. I've heard him on a ton of podcasts and stuff yeah. in the past, and I've, I've heard him speak, and he's got a good sense of humor about him. I, who knows what the hell he's doing right now? He's, I, <laughs> I, I, I picture exactly what you're saying. I think he's just sitting there eff, effing with people while having real conversations on the phone leading up to the draft, and uh, he's, you know, whatever. He's just having some fun. Nothing like spending four grand just for the LOLs, man. I mean, yeah. That's it. Got to do it. Absolutely. Uh, well, keep, let's let's keep it with the NBA. Before we move on to to your your baby, the F one, we need an, a, a weekly F one update. Before we move on to that, any any finals, actual finals takeaways from the hobby perspective? What are we doing with Chris Paul, Giannis, anybody else that uh, is making a move for you? Yeah. So the the finals, it really has a huge impact on these two teams and and the players uh, as far as their hobbies concerned. So what I've been doing just personally, I mentioned it on the, I think the episode with Ryan, like I've just been making drafts of every possible player that can go any cards I have of any possible player that can go off in this series. I have drafts ready to go. So for example, today, during the game, game one was tonight. I was when Cam Johnson went off in the first half. I had a couple RPAs, um, <laughs> like actually I think I have some right here that I was just I was just firing off onto eBay. So I like I have one from Panini Noir, which is from last year. Noir came out this past week for 21, 2021. This is a 1920 Cam Johnson rookie patch autograph, so just on card. And I put it up 99 cents, like I said, for I did 10 days, so let it go through as long of the finals as you can. And um, it's already gotten a ton of hits. It has like 20 watchers in the last two hours. So that's great. Wow. Um, and I put up this one is out of opulence as well. So I just have some of these Cam Johnson cards. Like, listen, they're they're middle of the road patch autographs from a rookie perspective. But you're, uh, this is the only time I'm going to maximize his window. He's going to be on the national stage. Like, even if he progresses in his career, he's still now going to be, what, fourth fiddle on a Phoenix team that's going to be competing for a couple of years, right? Like, what, when else am I maximizing a Cam Johnson window? So, like, this is the time to do it for those types of things. I did the same thing with some Mikael Bridges cards tonight. I've been selling DeAndre Ayton throughout the playoffs, but it's it really culminated for me tonight where I've had an RPA of his up as at Buy It Now, for an immaculate Ricky patch autograph where I've gotten offers around 200 under my asking price today during the game, he had like 19 rebounds. Somebody came yeah. in and scooped it right up at my asking price. So, you know, that's kind of something that I expected could happen if he made it this far, but like, that's the kind of stuff you're going to see in the finals. So from a, just an everyday hobby grinding perspective, that's, that's where I'm at with it. Very cool. Very cool. I think you nailed it last week too, on the higher end with Chris Paul, um, you mentioned that if you were looking to buy Chris Paul, that the, you know, if he makes the finals and, or that I think they had made the finals at that point, but if he wins, wins the title, that the legacy might be cemented at that point, mm -hmm. prices may never come down from there. We're already kind of seeing that. I think for him, his 2005 tops Chrome at a PSA 10 is up 64% in the last 30 days. So, yep. you know, if, if the sun's close this thing out, he's got a title under his belt. One of the best point guards of all time. That, that price probably isn't coming down a whole lot from where it's at now. Yep. I have um, two. Booker. Sorry, go ahead. Go yeah. for it. Go, no, yeah, go no, ahead. I, I have two tops paper rookies of Chris Paul at PSA right now that I expect to 10, uh, which I'm excited about that. But yeah, oh, it's, very nice. it's, it's exactly right. Chris Paul, you're, you know, we're kind of stuck with him now at this level. I think, I don't think it's goes down, you know, small dips like any other player sure. in the off season, but just from a, I think he's going to reach new heights where in the same way he's going to reach new heights in his legacy. I mean, if he wins the finals, he's a top three point guard of all time. I mean, you could make the argument that he already is, but you, you could put him right in there with magic Isaiah and him. Like, I, I think that's the tier at that point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're talking new levels with Chris when winning a finals at age 36, which is just awesome, man. I'm so happy for Chris Paul. I, I, I love it. I love to see it this right now. Yeah, the storylines. I mean, the storylines in the finals are great. It's hard not to have a rooting interest for one of these teams because, you know, Giannis maybe getting the monkey off his back finally and, and coming back from the hyper extended knee that looks so nasty yep. in the Eastern Conference finals. So everyone's cheering for that. Uh, Chris Paul's running mate, Devin Booker, 2005 Panini Prism PSA 10 is up 21% in the last 30 days. Uh, and then Middleton, who who closed out the Eastern Conference finals for the Bucks. 2012 Panini Prism PSA 10s up 170% in the last 30 days. And that was a guy that just felt, I don't own any Middleton, but that was a guy that felt like, um, you know, the, the, the performance of, you know, what he did in the last couple of games in the Eastern Conference Finals might have might have boosted his market a little bit too much. Oh, yeah. And if you're looking to, like like you said, with Aiton um, and Bridges, obviously he's a little bit better caliber than those type of players. But if you're looking to maximize a selling window for somebody like that, it makes sense to, to offload some Middleton if you're holding on to any of that. Oh, I, I, absolutely. I have, I've been selling Middleton patch autograph stuff, not, not even rookies, just like short printed 
uh, yeah. like iMac, Patch Auto, Acetate, nice cards that were probably like eighty dollar cards, seventy dollar cards for most of his career. They're at two, three hundred dollar range in the middle of auctions right now. So again, that's I'm tripling what I probably could have ever gotten in his entire career on that kind of stuff, which is great to see. Um, Booker, yeah, Booker's going to hit huge levels during this final. So I, yeah. I was watching a card probe scene, a silver PSA ten prism ended tonight. Uh, he's very strategically timed it. Ended in the during the game went for eighty eight hundred dollars. Oh, which is <laughs> super high for so let's look at this so the pop on this card is only 169 so wow. i mean you know that's the silver that's again that's the difference just between 2015 prism and 2018 prism you know a three-year period yeah. um and by the way you can go on some of these sites and get like the cello like the the hanger packs of this stuff still was sealed wax of 2015 16 for cheaper prices than you can for 1920 2021 um and you're chasing devin booker and nikola Jokic silvers in that stuff just saying just like if you want to go buy wax and you're yeah. spending you're spending a couple thousand dollars i'd rather go buy retail or you know stuff that i know i can hit the orange or the silver of booker or Jokic than i can go get you know zion and jaw that i still don't know what their outlook's going to be we have two bona fide top 15 players right there right um you said the pop you said the pop on booker was 169 169 the silver psa 10 according to card ladder I mean, so the, one went for 8800 today this is easy and i'm obviously cherry picking here but uh lucas silver prism you have a guess on that on what his pop gun is. I feel is. like I. Uh, you probably know this just off the no, back. No, I don't. With like five thousand, I, I really don't. Uh, know. No, you're you're a little high. Two thousand, two thousand sixty-four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But right, still, right, right, I mean, that's right. crazy, right? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, I know. To, yeah. To your point. To your point. The the print runs on these things, and obviously, there's a little bit of a difference between Devin Booker's market and Luca's market, but. Yeah, but the two thousand for Luca, like that's the same reason why I say I'm not. Uh, even though the silver stuff is going to be affected for the ultra modern, I'm still not mm-hmm. super concerned about that because think about just two thousand compared to the seventeen thousand plus or whatever. It's just so so oh, much yeah. more man- manageable yeah. from a, an investment strategy perspective. Uh, you know, yeah, the Devin Booker. So I the the last one that Card Ladder had monitored from the last two weeks was sixty six hundred a week ago. So that's twenty two hundred dollar wow. increase. And that's yeah, just from a ton of sense. one game, one of a final. So, uh, I, you know, Suns win this finals and Devin Booker, let's say he's in the MVP conversation or at least, uh, you know, finals MVP or at least has a great series like we'd expect him to. I, I would not expect, I would not be surprised to see that card hit five figures by the end of the series. Wow. Not at all. I really wouldn't. I mean, if it's just one for 8,800, that could be $10,000 card, if, uh, you know, in two weeks. No, no reason why it can't be. So. Yeah, people talk about the the lack of impact it seems like they've had for the overall market during the playoffs. But the the players that are performing, the uh, the teams that are still live, there's definitely an impact on these guys' markets for sure. Yeah, don't tell me encore performance doesn't impact the market. No, no, never. I'm not speaking to anyone specifically, but uh, it's All right. it's BS. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna we're gonna move on. We're already running long, but I am gonna see the floor to you. We're getting our weekly update in. I woke up and caught maybe ten laps of the Austrian Grand Prix. But give me your weekly F1 update. We're going to make this a, a weekly series now that you're the F1 guy. I freaking love this. I was golfing <laughs> Sunday morning, so I only caught the first – well, no, I, I actually I shouldn't say this. I was going to say I only caught the first 10 laps or so at home, but then I watched the rest on my phone on the golf course. Oh, my so, gosh. Uh, Get out know, of here. Yeah, in between Get my, out of here. In between my tee shots, had it on right there. It was with, um, it was with my brother-in-law, who's, who I've gotten super into it. He just finished the docuseries as well, so you know we're into it. I'm gambling on F1 now, Cody. I'm gambling oh on it. I love it. I won $1,000 this weekend <laughs> on, on, fan, on F1. I put – uh, two five hundred dollar bets on Lando Nor- Norris to podium for McLaren. He was in the he was uh, the second pole position, meaning he was second in line to start the race, and he was plus money to podium. And I get like he's surrounded by all these Mercedes and Red Bulls, so like yeah. you know, people would think he's gonna fall. But still, to me, like the, the kid's been an absolute stud all year. So uh, that's where I'm at in F1. He's my he's my hottest guy that I'm I'm investing in right now. Um, he's a he's like nineteen. Or 20, I guess he's 21. Now he started when he was 19. So this is his third year driving. He started as a driver for McLaren. Now they're basically the third best car on the grid right now. And he's a British kid who is been, you know, in every single race essentially. So yeah. I have some color variations of his rookie cards here. So I have an orange. Beautiful. This is the the base. It's out of 25. I have a variation, uh, the aqua out of 99. Uh, and that kid's just just awesome. And his market's been been really really hot so those those cards would would hit over a thousand dollars easily um is it safe to say from an roi perspective now that you're winning better on f1 that it's this is the sport that's made you the most money out of any sport even with a milli win even with a milli win in football yeah well obviously obviously i'm kidding um yes (laughs) well i will say 
it yeah just for the pure joy it gave me absolutely it's um it it yeah. is it has given me the the most winnings in in that perspective but it you know it's it's basically all I'm buying still you know as far yeah. as you know I we've spoken a little about some buy low guys and like I still think I have some more windows on that for for this off season and stuff so um I will be doing some of that and I you know I'm I'm buying here and there I'm buying some football guys and and things like that but for the most part just buying in bulk um it's it's mostly um mostly F1 uh right now which is great. Yeah yeah so Lando is a guy his his market's up nice Max Verstappen who won the race again just continuing to dominate for Red Bull. His base market has also been up so I've been seeing like his base market hitting the 5 600 dollar range for the Sapphire cards which is wow. which is really nice to see he's actually catching up to what Lewis Hamilton's have dipped to. So um the gap at least for them in base cards is has kind of narrowed for sure. Were you bummed to see that the uh, a Japanese card shop pulled the Lewis Hamilton one of one super fractor? I was super bummed. Were you bummed to see that? Bummed. Have you? So, were you chasing that? Well, I've, I haven't opened too much of the pure tops chrome, which is what that came okay, out of. I've done sapphire. mostly the sapphire, like ninety percent sapphire. I've done some of the, the tops chrome, but the sapphire. I don't think the Popper Dashara. It's like they're one of one. It's just a pink card. I call it a. Yeah. We call it, it in my break room where we do it. We call them Papa Giorgios, just because that's really much easier <laughs> to to say. Uh, <laughs> I don't think the Papa Giorgio one of one has been pulled yet. So there's still something to uh to to go for, but yeah, the F one. F F one's burning holes in my pocket just for as much as I'm buying, but I'm selling it at an equally uh, consistent rate at least. So but yeah, if you, if you guys want to hang out with Gary in any break rooms, he's constantly breaking F one. So that's yeah. So that's, catch catch him in the breaking streets. Literally, that's 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 all I'm breaking right now. That's it. All right, are you are you ready to get into the listener questions today? Yeah, but it's not too late to get into F one. It's still very early on in the season. Go F one. Love it. Love it. All right, guys, if you aren't following yet on another another housekeeping item here, we're starting to we'll stop badgering you with things that we're asking you to do. But if you're not following the uh, Twitter account or the Instagram account, please do so now. We're trying to push those live slowly and get some content out there and, and try and give you guys some actionable information on those pages. But the Twitter account is at collection ETR. And then, Gary, what's the what's the Instagram handle at establish the collection full just the full word. Yeah, so Gary Gary crushes the Instagram stuff. He able he was able to get the the actual handle that we needed, and I couldn't secure it for the Twitter account. So you guys can blame me for that one. But at Collection ETR for Twitter and establish the collection on Instagram. We yeah. got some good questions and and good questions in the Discord as well. So if you guys aren't in a Discord but are established the run subscribers, all you need is a draft kit or in in season subscription. Uh, catch us there. We had some fun conversations today in the Discord, but. Without further ado, let's get into it. Question one from Johnny C, nineteen ninety three. When do you believe is the best buying time? Best time to buy cards for each sport: off season, mid season, spring training, or preseason? Seems like the answer is answer is obvious, but maybe there's more to it. So, what are your thoughts on when is the right time to buy? Yeah, so let's. Um, I want to take this for for each sport. So let's talk football for uh, basically the big three sports that we've spoken about here. I want to take this for football, baseball, basketball separately. Let's um and and you know hop in if you have if you think differently, Cody, because I think there's yeah. there's no necessarily right answer to this question, but it's a great question yeah. because, you know it is something that we're all trying to maximize the right time to, to get in on something, right? We all want to get in when something's, you know, we all want to buy dips. That's it. We all yeah, think right. we're smart enough to be buying dips. So um, I, I will talk you through how I do my best to do it. Now, 2020, we just have to consider as an outlier because we basically saw when this market completely, completely boomed, we basically saw off seasons mean very, very little for most of these sports. So uh, I think you have to look at it as an outlier. And we've already seen 2021 kind of come back on this. Um, and you just look historically off seasons, obviously in general, of the time to buy, but we can get more specific in each sport. So for football, um, you know, I think that we could look at it from the best time to sell, right? I actually think the best time to sell for football is not necessarily in season. It is the time bleeding right up to the season. So like the right now ish, like probably end of July, early August, people start doing fantasy football drafts. Uh, preseason starts coming around ESPN is doing NFL live four times a day. And that's all people can talk about and everything, you know, and um, you know, ton of speculation and, and who are the sleeper skill position players, what quarterbacks are taking leaps, all that kind of conversations dominating their airwaves as baseballs to kind of just in the dog days. That's when I think people start to really, really um, be buying football. So that's like, I think that's the time to start to be opportune to sell. So I wouldn't really necessarily be looking to be buying at that time from like, you know, beginning of august through beginning of september um i probably would not be looking to be buying i'd be using that time through the season to be selling now for football any other time is really good to buy for me my favorite time is probably um 
you let the Super Bowl noise die down. So Super Bowl ends, uh, you know, unless uh, there, there are going to be certain situations, if this player played in the Super Bowl, like you were able to catch little quick Patrick Mahomes dips right after the Super Bowl. So yeah, you have to obviously be attuned to what's going on in that game or in the playoffs there. If you, you know, if someone disappoints like any other sport, but probably wait for that to die down. And then a month or two, two weeks to a month later, I start to buy in football through, through most of that off season. So that's, yeah. that's what I look for, for football. You, you have any thoughts there? No, I think you nailed it. I think that the the off season buying window gets overplayed a little bit. The window, I think, is at least from my experience, is even shorter than that. Yeah. It's not even really an off season buying window. It's kind of like post Super Bowl buying window, like yep. you just mentioned. Like you're looking at late February, early March, April, and you're probably holding a lot of that stuff until, like you said, late July, early August, September, and then you might have a secondary buying window. I think if the players that you were targeting or players that you were thinking about buying or already did buy don't perform yeah. out the gate. And now you got to think about that from what your investment horizon is. Are you buying these players to flip at the end of the season? Or are you buying these players because you think you believe in them long term? Yeah. I think that's the second buying window. If these players just don't perform right out of the gate, you might see a little bit of a sell off and might totally. be able to catch a secondary dip. Totally agree. So that I think that applies for football. And then I think that really applies for basketball. So yeah. for, for basketball, for me, it's the off season for sure. Like, you know, buy the guys that um, you're speculating on. Like we talked a little bit last week, like the Nikhil Alexander Walker types if Lonzo mm -hmm. goes, you know, guys like that, that you, you like their situation changing for sure, you know, buy then. Uh, but I think basketball is a perfect example of what you just said. You know, if somebody that you were into is vastly underperforming in season to the point where their perception has now taken a hit to even below or to taken a hit that it has never has before, you know, to, it's reached a yeah. low where it, it had, didn't even get to it in an off season when people weren't even discussing this guy because his performance has been so bad. You know, that's the time to jump on a guy that you believe in for whatever the reasons Cody just said, whether it's somebody you believe in, somebody that you think has hype around, you know, or that the market will just go back up inevitably because of who that guy is, whatever it may be, that's the time. Baseball, I think, is a different piece. Baseball, I think, is an offseason buy sport, period, because we've mm -hmm. been talking a lot about um, – We've been talking a lot about just right now. We like there, you could find buys in the in the season still. Like it's such a grind that the 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 biggest time you're going to maximize is when no one's thinking about this stuff at all, and it's right. the off season, and it's guys that have not yet hit their ceilings. Like it's the Vlad and the Otani's. Like those, I know it's obviously you know we're 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 talking at the top of the market right now for guys that are in the MVP conversation, but it's those kind of guys in the off season next year. Like say Soto continues to disappoint this entire year, you can catch him in I don't know December. You could probably you know be looking to buy up that stuff at 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 uh, numbers that no one's thinking about those guys. So you keep those are the times that I'm keeping an eye on auctions for for baseball. Yeah, I think you nailed it. Off season, and then if you're if you're thinking about guys long term or guys that maybe even just dip temporarily, there might be a an, an early season buying window for guys that have underperformed out of the gate. Yep. Totally. All right, ready for question two. All right, question two from Jeff Hicks. Do either of you trust the slabs from other places outside of PSA? I know look and selling remain a factor for a lot of people. So what say you? I know we've talked about this in previous episodes, but this does deserve a, a more in-depth conversation. I think it goes right in line with the discussion that we had earlier about PSA. So what, what say you on different slabs from other grading companies? Yeah, so I'll take this in two parts. Like, do I like trusting the actual look of the slab and like the the slab itself for, from a selling perspective, and and trusting the grading company itself? Um, yeah, I trust I trust a couple, and and PSA is is obviously one of them that you have to trust if you're into this for buying and selling because it it holds the premium. So yes, PSA of course, and then I still definitely trust Beckett. But I and I mentioned this on our grading episode. I look at Beckett for thicker cards, thicker stock cards and autograph cards. I, I like the idea of grading the autograph separately being completely separated. I love the idea of subgrades as well. I think it's great that you can see exactly why your card has a certain number. Um, and to me, it still holds a premium for, you know, like Bowman first Bowman Chrome autograph cards of nine, five, 10 is it's one of the few things that will hold the same value as a PSA 10. So, you know, you have to know what you're looking at as far as autographs are concerned, but yeah, I, I definitely trust it for those types of things. Now I getting to the point where I used to send a bunch of different things into Beckett and I still might, if I think one subgrade 
where it would really kill it on PSA where I think the other three might balance it out for something like Beckett. Maybe I'll send just a refractor type card there, but knowing that PSA has such a premium on it, I am much less likely these days to just be sell- sending my everyday, uh, you know, I don't know the Steph Curry refractor 2012 um, prism. I know this won't grade out perfectly, but would I rather send it to PSA and hope I get a nine or send it to BGS in those slight hopes of a 9.5, but a better chance of it being a nine there, you know, the difference between a PSA nine and a BHA BGS nine is so huge for just a refractor card like this that I'd rather go to PSA. So for BGS, I'm probably still just trusting it for the autograph and the thicker patch auto type cards. As far as just looks concerned, I still like the look of a Beckett slab. So I trust it in that consent. Th- those are really the only two I'm using. I know people have been really into SGC recently because their turnaround times are really good and their prices are back down. Um, but to me, the, the price in the secondary market is still just not reflected there for, for what I'd be comfortable with. Yep. I agree with you. I don't have a whole lot to add there. I would say the only other thing um, that I would add is if you're just looking at stuff, not from a resale value, but stuff and we, we kind of tend to forget this as we're, we're, we're talking through these episodes, but if you're looking at stuff just from a personal collection standpoint, I think the HGA slabs look pretty good. I don't know about the grading quality or anything like that, but if you just want to have a slabbed up card, uh, don't necessarily care too much about the resale value. You want to trust that the grade's accurate. Then, yeah, any of the any of the big three players, um, SGC, Beckett, and obviously PSA, are the go-to's. But like Gary said, if you're looking for resale value and looking for trust in the grade, PSA certainly deserves a premium from that. Yeah, I should say I think SGC is really good for for uh, PC for, for PC items. If you're yeah. just trying to get something slabbed up, like I, I personally don't love the look of that slab. I know a lot of people like it. They like the black mat. They think it's sleek. I don't really love it. It kind of takes away from the card itself for me, where the other two are clear around it, so it's highlighting the card. I think that black look around the card is is a little dark for what I want to be with the card. But some people really like it. So if you're building out sets or something like that, I think it's great for that because it's cheaper. You could trust the grade more than some of the not no name companies, and it's it's um you know, the turnaround and the price is right. So I think it's great for that. HGA, I still think is going to be good for that, but they're experiencing a lot of problems right now as far as, um, first of all, just volume. And yeah, uh, they, they're making mistakes on their slabs left and right. The CEO came out and addressed it recently, basically just owning up to it um, and saying that as of right now, um, they're doing their best to fix those types of mistakes, but they're they're basically a startup. So, you know, it's, you know, right. you're, you're taking a little bit of a risk there. That said, um, you know, I, I would I would definitely give it a try for certain cars that necessarily might not be worth uh, too much money. Sure. Well, keeping with the theme, seems like we're grading heavy on this uh, on this episode. But we got a question this morning in Discord from Parlor Fifteen in the Established Learn Collectibles Discord. He says he's got a Michael Jordan Jambalaya card. Find it hard to discern differences between the graded cards that I have seen online. What should I focus on? So we you and I went back and back and forth off air before we recorded uh, before we started recording. And we're trying to d- determine which card this is because this is a pretty valuable card, right? Yeah. Looking at some of the most recent sales. So um, we think we've figured out what it is. And, and Parlor was nice enough to share a picture uh, through our Discord channel. Very cool card, very expensive card, uh, and, and very, very expensive card, a Grail type card if graded properly. So do you have any advice for Parlor? And for those that don't know, you can look it up and I'll, and I'll post pictures on Twitter if you want to follow that. But um, it's a it's a die cut type card from 1997 Skybox uh, EX 2001 set. So I- any special information for him on what he should be looking for and, and what he needs to do with this card to try and maximize the value? Yeah, I didn't know much about this set. I heard the name Jambalaya before, but I didn't really know much about this set. I think it's sweet. It's awesome that one of our listeners yeah. has one of these cards. Um, yeah, they're die cut like oval. So it's not like a traditional die cut either. It's like a circle, which I actually think helps the pot potential grade of it um, because the edges are smoother, right? So you're you're not yeah. necessarily getting screwed over from a, a chipped corner or a chipped edge, which is why Cody, g- g- props to Cody for doing some deep dives on the pop reports of some of these cards. Uh, he, Cody pulled that 87% of all these graded cards, these Jambalaya cards have graded a PSA 8 or better. Now for something from the late 90s that's considered modern, you know, um, but like, you know, modern vintage for whatever, you know, for, for lack of a better word, um, that's that's not bad at all. And for something that's MJ and clearly are short printed like uh, Grail type inserts, this, um, you know, you're, you're going to get good return on an 8, 9 or 10. You know, you're also going to get good return parlor on the raw card itself. So if you don't want to take the chance, if you think for whatever reason, you know, I can't tell fully from your picture what that card is necessarily looking like from a condition standpoint. But if you think for whatever reason that there's a big scratch or something and it might go lower than the eight, um, I would probably sell it raw. Uh, I'm seeing one from May 16th that sold 
for the guy had it listed for 42 grand. He got half of that. He got 21, five. I mean, you're, you're talking a $21,000 card there, my friend, like you're, you're sitting pretty. However, if you think it's going to get that eight, nine or 10, it's probably worth sending it to PSA. I, I, I definitely think it, um, it, it is. Yeah. There haven't been any recent sales of any tens. In fact, the last one was from August of 2020. Um, but August, 2020, a 10 sold for $51,600. And then we got a more recent sale in May of an eight of that card, 31 grand. So, Right. Yeah, like Gary said, twenty-one grand raw, thirty-one grand in an eight. Just kind of, you're gonna have to kind of make your own determination on based off based off of what you see from the card and try and comp it as best you can to some of the stuff online. But I know that's gonna be tough because it's it, it is so tough looking at a picture online versus your card in hand, trying to ascertain the differences between an eight, nine, or ten. Yep, and I think an eight for this type of card is worth doing it because people, if you're in the market for this kind of card, you're going to want it protected. You're going to want it slab. You're probably looking at not only eBay but places like auction houses for this type of card. So you're going to want it in that protector. So you're going to get a little bit of a premium even at an eight, where normally um, an eight or a nine is going to be the same, or in eights instance, less than a raw card. This is not going to be the case for a card like this. So cards like this that are going to be these high, high value from. I don't know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, you're, you are going to see a premium even on an eight or nine as opposed to a modern card where it probably is better, more beneficial to sell it raw. All right. I know you got a few things to say on question four, so I'm going to give us a little time here and, and maybe we'll keep this thing under an hour yet. But question four from Eisenhower T10 in the Discord. Looking for thoughts on Lamelo redemption cards. I pulled a Lamelo rookie signature in a noir break over the weekend. However, I heard he hasn't signed anything yet. I'm not collecting Lamelo, and I plan on selling. Outside of unknown market movement, would you guys recommend redeeming it and waiting to sell, or sell the actual redemption card? Yes. What do you think? So, so I have a lot of thoughts on redemptions in general. Unfortunately, it's a big thing with Panini and modern day Panini cards. It, it's unavoidable. Every big product except Flawless um, has redemptions in it. That's it. Flawless is the only one where everything is live. So. Um, you know, it's something that we all have to deal with. Now, I'm going to take this question first and we'll expand this question out. And then we're going to keep this thing under an hour at 51 minutes because we'll, we'll close up shop after we talk about, we talk about this topic. So uh, Lamello, Lamello is a very specific situation. If I'm you, Eisenhower, and I appreciate you, my friend, you're very active in the Discord. We appreciate communicating with you, my friend. But um, if I'm you, I'm selling this redemption. I, I If I get any Lamello ball redemptions, I'm going to sell them as well. You know, everything that's, uh, you know, I, I have people I talk to in this hobby that know some things. Everything is just pure speculation still at this point. However, there is some real, real concern that Lamelo Ball is not going to be signing these redemptions. Now, I don't know what kind of contract he has with Panini and 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 you know what Panini might do if he doesn't. You know, I, but I know this: Panini needs Lamelo way more than Lamelo needs Panini. Now, Lamelo is going out and starting his own NFTs, and I think he has really big ambitions for his personal collectibles that he wants to have complete ownership over and. Frankly, I don't think he gives a damn about Panini and signing their cards. Now, again, that's all speculation. Maybe for his rookie cards, like I've never seen anyone just full on not ever, ever sign them for because, the, you know, you you are, um, you know, you're, you're obligated to sign. He's obviously signed on with Panini at some point. He didn't do what we said Darius Garland did last year, which was never mm -hmm. even sign a deal with Panini. So um, he did do that at some point if he's in these products as a redemption. Now, will he sign them? I would say maybe hopefully one day, but I don't know. Now, also, you're still getting such a premium on Lamelo right now, being this hot, hot rookie from this class, that you're going to get a really pretty penny for that redemption. Um, you really will. So, for me, I'm I'm doing I'm uh, I'm selling Lamelo particularly. Do you have any thoughts there, Cody? No, I I kind of agreed with you in my message from the Discord. Now, I've never had any experience with with dealing with redemption cards, so. Have you sold any redemption cards yourselves or have you redeemed all of them and then sold after the fact? What's Have you had any actual personal experience with selling redemption cards? Yeah, I've sold redemptions a ton. And uh, so here's my, my general thought on redemptions. I lean on the side of selling if it's a player like Lamelo that is possibly not going to sign or if there's other players that kind of have been notorious for not signing all of their cards. Giannis is an example of this. Giannis a year and a half ago, basically posted an Instagram story of a ton of his own cards that he has that he basically just kept for himself. Kind of a dick move, um, <laughs> honestly, but uh, you know, Giannis signs most of his cards, but there are some people that have never received some of those cards. Some of the one-on-one -on -one stuff, like he's kept it. Uh, wow. And, you know, so like there are some guys like that, if you're really in tune, that are either notoriously late signers. So, you know, you might not get that card for a year or just don't sign a lot. Those guys I'd rather sell because they're going to be if they're big names and, you you know, you could just guarantee the ROI. Um, 
for all right so so real, real ahead, quick yeah. here, mm -hmm. here would be my question if i was eisenhower and this is the reason why i asked you if if let's say lamello does sign let's say mm -hmm. the you get the redemption card back in three months right i mean that, that that seems like a pretty good good case scenario maybe not best case but probably proper case scenario that you would get the card back in three months uh if things went well what would the redemption card sell for today versus what the actual auto card would sell for in three months is there so, i mean is there a huge difference or is there enough of like people wanting to speculate and people willing to take on that risk that the redemption cards wouldn't be worth that much less or the redemption cards might actually be worth more so than the auto is, card in a couple months i think that this 20 20 21 class is a very unique situation because most of these cards are coming out after the season um yeah. where when these do go live if they say it's three months you know, we are still likely going to be in the off season. So I don't think the difference between a redemption for a guy like LaMelo Ball or if Anthony Edwards is redemption is going to be that much of a difference when the card is live as opposed to the redemption. I think it's still a lot of it's going to be the hype and speculation, which you're getting that hype now more than you're going to get it in three months. So for somebody like him, I actually don't know how big of a difference it's going to make. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see about that if and when he does sign. But I do think historically um, – there are certainly examples where the live card is worth a hell of a lot more than the redemption. Uh, I, my, the best example I can think of of this is Luka Doncic from his rookie class in Immaculate. So that was 2018-19. Um, he was a redemption for all of his autograph stuff in that. Uh, and, you know, there wasn't really necessarily any fear of him uh, not signing. But they, you know, his his RPAs, which is this card, um, from that that class on card autograph mm -hmm. rookie patch autograph we're going for i want to say during the product release when these cards started to come out uh, around three to four thousand dollars and then these cards come like a three month two three month window after and they immediately double now this said i don't remember exactly when they were mailed out if it was during the playoffs or if it was like kind of right after the season but he had clearly taken a leap even sure. further than people realized he was able to do in his rookie year and the cards look good and you know I'm very happy. I actually had three of these redemptions. Um, I have two of them here. One's a jersey number, so out of 77. You can see it's kind of got like a platinum glow. One's the regular RPA. Uh, I also had a premium RPA that was going to be out of like 25 that I sold for like four grand as a redemption. That was a big mistake. That was one of my biggest mistakes in this hobby, actually. Wow. Because that card probably is a is, – I don't want to think about how much more that's worth now. But – um. Yeah, so there is a risk in those kind of things. Now, however, for Eisenhower's card, he said it's just a rookie autograph, base rookie autograph card. I wouldn't take the risk. I'd sell it. Now, if when IMAC comes out or National Treasures is a better example, that's supposed to come out over the next month. If his if he's a redemption in that, you have a real decision to make. You have a real, real decision to make because those redemptions are going to go for 20 grand, uh, 15, wow. 20 grand because yeah. that's his true RPA of NT. It's his flagship RPA. Um, but – the, the live card might go for more than that. So you have a redemption you have a decision to make. It depends what your blank rolls looking like at that point. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, for, for Steph Curry, just, just to, to close, close up the loop in my perspective on this, Steph Curry is often a redemption. He just signs late. He likes to sign after the season for whatever reason, but he always signs. It's just known in the hobby. He always signs. You're going to get that card eventually. It might be four or five months, but you're going to get it. So for a guy like that, yeah, I want the live Steph and Curry autograph. Like if you, if mm -hmm. you're okay waiting up for the money, then yeah, you redeem it. Every guy's a little bit different. I do think the other the people that I like to redeem are the lower end guys that haven't hit their hype yet or like prospects because, you know, you're not going to be getting top dollar at, on the redemption for somebody like that. You would rather take the chance and wait for maybe you have wait a six month window and then they broke out. You know, if you're, if it's going to be a $20 card or less as a redemption, you might as well just g give it the go. But if, if, you know, again, yeah. I'd rather you're on the side of caution for guys that are notorious or might not sign, or if you need a, uh, or the other thing is while the product is still hot, something like noir is going to have the most steam while the product is new. It, it, it just is. We're yeah. not talking, this isn't the, it's a great product. I like noir a lot, but it's not the flagship flagship autograph patch auto stuff. So that's the other thing with those types of things. You, you, you do get a premium when the, the product is still new. Yes, makes a ton of sense. Tons of helpful tips for listeners. Hopefully that helps Eisenhower. Hopefully that helps Parler and everybody else. And ask questions. We appreciate you guys for helping us get this episode up. Uh, anything else you want to hit the people with before we get out of here? Um, no, no, but we have 90 seconds more to keep this under an hour. So I'm very proud of us. I didn't ramble too much compared to other weeks. Maybe. Who knows? Maybe I did. Round I'll applause. listen back. I, th I think we crushed it. We'll see. We'll see if we can start keep cre creeping these things even lower under an hour. I bet by, by the time Luke gets the music added to this, we might be right at an hour. So yeah, good point. Uh, let's get out of here. For Gary, I'm Cody. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week. Enjoy the finals, everyone.